Well, let's get started. First of all, I want to uh, thank you guys for taking the time out to, to listen to this. I'll try to keep it at a fast moving pace for you, but I'm jumping from several different subjects. So feel free, as was mentioned before, if you have a question, just jot it down in the chat. And then afterwards, we can go back afterwards and I'll try to address everybody's question. Whoever's questions I can't answer, maybe due to time or other circumstances, I'll try to follow up with email and get you the answers if for some reason we can't get to that. Um, but again, please feel free. If, if you have a question, don't hesitate. There, there's no dumb questions, especially in the world of cybersecurity. And, and I do want to take a minute to really uh, thank Beyond Insurance and all those behind the scenes for putting this together so we could spend the next hour or so to discuss some of these important matters. Well, well first, to, to start off, what I'd like to share is just to put it in perspective a little bit, um, the takeaways that we're going to get from this. And you may have, have read these before, but just to, to run down them real quick. Uh, the cost of cybercrime, just going to briefly touch on that. We hear about it a lot, but how bad is it really? Um, a lot of the common attack vectors I'm going to weave in and talking about not being too social on social media. I'm going to talk a little bit about skimmers, credit card skimmers and uh, ATM skimmers and the fear and some basic protections that we could take into play there. Also the dark web, which is kind of the, the underbelly of the internet where a lot of the cyber criminals spend their time in buying and selling our personal information, how that works. And I'll do it again at a higher level. So don't worry, it's not a deep tech dive or anything. And, and throughout this, I'm going to try to share cyber best practices. And that's going to be everything from multi-factor authentication, best practices with Wi-Fi and hotspots, things like that. Um, phishing attacks, we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and even data backups, how important that is. And again, a lot of this is thinking it from the perspective of insurance, but it does apply to all different industries for small business owners, mid-sized business, enterprise level, you name it. A lot of these best practices should be uh, instilled. So first off, as what I mentioned there, talking about the cost of cybercrime, what kind of damage is this doing to businesses? Well, cybercrime is supposed to cost the world in estimates $10.5 trillion by the year 2025. That's not too far away, only a couple couple years away. And that's a stat just recently put out by Cybersecurity Ventures. That is a tremendous amount of money, the damage. And again, that, that's really the culmination of all these different types of uh, cyber attacks, everything from, from ransomware, credit card skimming, identity theft, all that in a nutshell, 10.5 trillion, astounding. Just the ransomware part alone, and I, and I think this ties in nicely, so I was just going to spend just a brief moment on it. How bad is ransomware? Well, it's bad and it's, it's getting worse in some ways. They're fighting off some of the ransomware attacks very effectively, but there's still a lot of challenges out there. And I think those in the insurance industry certainly need to be kept aware and abreast to the problem of ransomware and how it keeps changing the actual strains of ransomware and the ways that you can respond to help possibly your clients there. Uh, a couple, couple stats that's kind of stand out to me. Each day, there's over 4,000 ransomware attacks that are reported, which means there's probably a lot more of them. We just don't hear about it. Uh, basically, about one every 11 seconds. It's actually increasing, so it's, it's even more frequent than that, but that's about the latest stat, at one every 11 seconds. And the average downtime, I thought this was interesting, a company that gets becomes a victim of a ransomware attack it takes them about 21 days to to really go through that attack until they're back up and normal and that could be by bringing in cyber experts law enforcement their trusted insurance uh, uh, provider um, working out all the kinks maybe restoring to a backup whatever but taking about 21 days just to get back to business as normal so depending upon the organization and how many computers on the network that is a, an astounding amount of time to get back to business. And in some cases, it's a lot worse. So we have to think about that downtime, the effect of it. And that helps, again, if you have to negotiate perhaps uh, a settlement there and far, as far as paying the ransom or trying different strains of, uh, you know, to combat the malware there to see if you have a decryptor key or whatever the case may be. So different things, again, to think about. And now we also have to worry about other things. Ransomware as a service, where there's, criminals on the dark web that are training and teaching other cyber criminals, new, newbies, how to actually perform ransomware, and, and they'll split the profits and different formulas in there. So there's a whole new um, generation of the cyber criminals coming out 
that are attacking and, and, and going after, especially ransomware, because it is so lucrative. And in many cases, what they're trying to do is kind of this double extortion where they'll exfiltrate data first. They'll basically get into your network, your computer, pull all of the data off that they can, first and foremost. Then they'll go back and encrypt everything. Why? Because this data that they pulled off is very valuable. So say you don't pay the ransom, your client doesn't pay the ransom. Well, now they can use this as extortion and say, hey, we've got all your data. We're going to make it go public. And, and maybe there's there's IP there. Maybe there's personal information, maybe it's credit card, bank accounts, wh whatever. That information they have. So they kind of get you one-two punch with that. And, and that's something that's becoming more and more popular with the cyber criminals. It allows them to leverage and command a, a higher dollar if, if they want, especially if you, if you don't play, play ball with them. So it's something to think about. The other thing is, how bad is the problem got? Well, just back in uh, 2018, the average payout for ransomware was about $5,000. A few years later in 2021, it was closer to uh, $200,000 plus, and it keeps going up and up when you average it out. So tremendous amount of money that is being spent just toward ransomware and the cost of cybercrime. So again, that's, that kind of puts it in perspective. It's not to scare people, but just reality. We need to know what this is so that way we can better uh, educate people educate our customers so they could stay safe and we could react quicker and get businesses back online faster. Very important. Um, now I'm going to transition a little bit over to another subject, but again, it's, it's paralleling cybercrime, and this is that of skimmers. And skimmers are a huge problem. They make up part of that 10.5 trillion estimate that, that we were talking about. Biting skimming scammers is what I kind of call this slide. And I just want to talk for a few minutes. There's, there's a lot of uh, stats and things I've done probably 50 presentations just on skimmers and Bluetooth skimmers. So, so first of all, what are skimmers? Skimmers really are a, an additional magnetic head. If we think about our traditional credit card or debit card, if we look on the back, and if you have one now, take it out of your pocket and look at it. And do you see a mag stripe on the back? Most all cards throughout the United States have a mag strip on the back. Many of them, if not all of them, eventually are now migrating over to what? Chip and pen. And that's important because that adds a layer of security. We'll talk more about layers of security a little bit later. But with your traditional credit card, again, looking on the back of it, if you see a mag strip, a mag strip there, you got to be careful. Why? Because anytime that's inserted or slid through a point of sale terminal in an, in an ATM, if, if it's a debit card or at the gas pump, especially, what's, what, what cyber criminals are doing is putting a second read head, and it's microscopic, very small fits on the tip of your finger. It's a magnetic read head, just like the one that's already in there. It's the second one. As that card gets inserted in the front or slides in, that second head is reading all your CVV data, your track one, track two data on that credit card. And that is easily stored into a little buffer. And then the cyber criminal either comes back later, removes the skimmer, or more commonly what they're doing now is using a Bluetooth skimmer and allows them wireless connectivity. They put the skimmer inside the ATM or inside of the gas pump. And as it collects hundreds and hundreds of cards per day, it allows them to simply come within proximity, about 75 foot of the ATM or the gas pump on their laptop and download all of those stolen credit cards. They go home and they have a machine and they simply burn fresh credit cards, your stolen credit card number or ATM number onto that card. And then they go shopping and typically they'll buy gift cards and then they'll give out the gift cards. Hey, here's a hundred dollar gift card to their girlfriend for Victoria's Secret. And they'll ask for $50 in cash. So it kind of is almost like a money laundering system, how they can spread out and effectively use skimmers to steal the cards and get money into their pocket and put it back into their um, cyber criminal gang. Because a lot of these are orchestrated gangs. Most of that information is also collected and grouped together and sold on the dark web. And we'll talk about that on the next slide a little bit more detail, how that's done and what are some things you can do to be proactive to fight that, to see if your information is being compromised on there. Um, just to jump back a second, you might wonder, well, how in the world do they get inside a gas pump and put a credit card skimmer in there? Well, right now there, there's six common keys for the 1.5 million gas pumps throughout the United States. In other words, I can go on eBay and I can buy one of these six keys and go up to any of the gas pumps, open them up. I take the uh, Bluetooth skimmer that I bought off of eBay or down in the dark web or, or somewhere else. 
and, and they range anywhere from $400 to about $1,600 is what I see them sell for. And they simply plug it inside where the credit card processing is. There's a, a Molex jack right there. It's a ribbon cable that comes off and the little small circuit there. And they tuck that into the, the mesh of wires, close it up and lock it. It takes about 30 seconds or so to actually place a Bluetooth skimmer inside of a gas pump, for example. So what it's telling you right away, there's very little, if any, security. Maybe there's cameras that'll catch you, but probably not. Because you could pull up, open your door, block the cameras at the right angle, open the gas pump, put the skimmer in, plug it in. You got power, lock it. You're done. You're in business. You drive away. Now, every day, or I should say throughout the day, every time somebody inserts their credit card into the point of sale terminal at the gas pump, a copy of their credit card information is put into a buffer. When the cyber criminal returns to the scene of the crime, hits his button on the laptop, hundreds of those stolen credit cards are again downloaded. He goes and burns fresh cards or groups them in reports and sells them on the dark web. Extremely lucrative. The average gas pump, for example, pulls in about $112,000 in stolen credit card, credit card fraud, before they find the skimmer. So it's a huge problem. So billions upon billions of dollars are stolen just in the U.S. every single year just from credit card skimmers. What can you do? Well, that's a common question. You know, if, if you're a consumer for your business, anybody, if you're fueling up, pay with cash. Cash is king. It's certainly a lot safer than credit card. Uh, if you use the gas pumps that are toward the center of the gas station, closest to the attendant, they're less likely to have skimmers installed. And there are tools and there's services that different companies and law enforcement do where they're actually scanning them. But, but oftentimes they're chasing. It's a cat and mouse game. So for me, I use cash at all gas pumps because I know how bad the problem is. Now, ATMs are a little bit different. ATMs, what they're typically trying to do is get what? Your ATM, your, your debit card number, and they got to get the PIN that you type in. Oftentimes, cyber criminals are creative. What they've realized is it's hard to get inside of an ATM. Some some Skimmers, they slide down the neck where your card goes in super thin, which is, again, a second read head and circuitry in there. Difficult to do and mechanically challenging because of all the things that the banks are putting in there to fight back against cyber criminals. So instead, what do they tend to do? They tend to take a bezel, and you see a bezel there. They mount a simple little pinhole camera, which is so small, it's the size of a pin, basically, the hole, and they stick a, a bezel, plastic, somewhere around so they could look down and view and see where you enter your actual pin. Why is that so important? Because that's a layer of authentication, your PIN. If my PIN is one, two, three, four. Now, if I enter that in and that camera sees that, they've got half the, half the equation, right? They've got my magical PIN. Now all they need to do is get my debit card number. Since it's hard to put to get the debit card out of the machine, what do they do? Typically where there's vestibules, you know, when you go to the bank after six o'clock or whatever, the bank's closed inside, but there's a little glass atrium or vestibule, you can get in there. But to do that, you got to stick your debit card in for the, you have the solenoid, open the door. I see a picture, I have a picture of it right there in the middle. That's where they put the skimmer. A couple screws, pop it out, install a skimmer in there with the mechanism, put it back together when no one's looking. Now, every time you go into the ATM to undo the door, you stick in your card, zzz, opens the door up, they just got your credit card number. You go in, you type in your PIN, they just got one, two, three, four. Now, later on, they correlate those two, and now they can create their own debit card, go to any ATM, and take your money out of your account immediately. So that's why you got to be really careful using debit. I prefer not using debit cards at all. I know some cases people say it's not practical, but they're extremely dangerous. Also, the laws of liability. If it's a credit card that's compromised, you as a consumer, you're only on the hook for 50 bucks. And I think it's the same is true with, as a business. Whereas debit card, they're taking money out of your account. Now you got to go fight to the issuing bank to get your money back. They took $1,000, you're $1,000 out. It may take months to fight back and forth and you got to do everything right to get your money back. So you see how difficult the problem is with skimmers and how it's so effective in this cyber criminal organization. Things that we need to keep in mind. And I mentioned about the dark web. That's where a lot of the stolen information is often fenced or sold on the dark web. Why? Because it allows some anonymity. And that's so important that cyber criminals aren't caught. So what we're going to do is jump, jump to the next slide here, talk a little bit about the dark web. Now, you, you may have be familiar with this, heard of the term dark web, or it may be totally mysterious. So I'm going to just talk at a very high level to start with here so we don't get too confused. But if you see in the picture there, there's a nice little 
iceberg. And that's often what's, what's uh, used to symbolize what the dark web is and kind of understand it a little bit. So if you view that, and hopefully you can see it on your screens there. Um, but what, what, what goes on is you have to realize where do we work? What are we working on right now? When you go on to say Google and you do a quick search for insurance company, we're working in what's called the surface web. In fact, the surface web where we do most of our work when we're going to websites and doing different searches and things like that, that represents about two tenths of a percent of the overall internet. So what does it tell you? The surface web is very small and that is representative of the top of that iceberg there where you see Google and all the different networks and Facebook and all that other stuff. Now, if you go to the deep web, what's under the water there, that, that larger area of the iceberg that's below the water, that represents uh, 500 plus times larger than that surface web, that top part. And inside of that, part of that is called the dark web. And that's, again, the dark web is a sliver of the deep web. And I'm not trying to overwhelm you with terms and acronyms, but I'm just trying to help you paint the picture so you understand it a little bit. Now, if you think about it, there's probably estimates of 12,000 to 20,000 plus different unique sites in the dark web. Normally, if you're going to go to a website, you go on Google and you type uh, beyond insurance, I may see it come up there, I click on it, it's actually indexed and it can easily be found, all that information. A lot of the information is stored in the uh, deep web. And, and that may be databases and files and information underneath this surface web. But the dark web also has some unique sites that 12 to 20,000, it's an unknown number. And you have to know the exact address so you can go to that website in the dark web. And that's where often cyber criminals are hiding stolen information. So if there's a ransomware attack on one of your customers, perhaps, and they steal a ton of information and they're gonna try to sell it, oftentimes they'll go to the dark web and put it on a website and say, hey, we just compromised XYZ company. We've got their IP. We've got their stolen credit cards. We've got their whatever, social security number list. All of those things, they break up in reports and sell on the dark web. And, and that helps you to appreciate why the dark web is important and the deep web is so important for the internet to run and to store information, but how dangerous it is. Now, just a brief blurb on the dark web and how it works and some of the things you, you, to get on the dark web, you use what's called the Tor network. It's called the Tor Onion Router. And what it allows you to do is anonymously go into this specific area of the dark web. And again, it's unindexed. The information is encrypted and it's bounced around. Just think of it this way, maybe to say it's simply different nodes, people around the world that have different nodes that'll bounce your traffic around. Why is that important? Because it allows anonymity. You don't know where it originates. So if I'm a cyber criminal sitting here in Metuchen, New Jersey, I'm on the dark web going through Tor, the Tor browser, tool specifically used for the, for the dark web. Nobody knows I'm in Metuchen, New Jersey. Why is that important? Again, if I'm buying or selling stolen guns or cocaine or, or lists of credit cards, whatever else it is, it's hard for law enforcement to find me. So again, that's why cyber criminals gravitate. Once they understand the, the dark underbelly of the internet, that's where they can perform a lot of their illegal activities, buying and selling these different things of stolen information from us. Um, difficult to track somebody down, not impossible, but difficult for law enforcement to track it down um, and actually find the location. It's expensive, it's time consuming. So unless it's a really big bus, like you think back years ago to Silk Road and a couple other large bus on the dark web, it's not happening as much as everybody would like. And as quick as they find where a location of a dark website is, tomorrow they could change it and move somewhere else. So we start to understand the inner workings of it and how dangerous it can be um, in the dark web and how effective it is. So again, proactive, what can you do? One thing that I do personally, and I recommend it to people I talk to within organizations, is do what's called a dark web audit. Company I work with, I have a relationship, full disclosure, Cyberlytica, but I always recommend them because they've helped me um, a lot of times doing these dark web audits. And what does it simply do is they're crawling the dark web constantly, looking through all these repositories and databases and things to see if there's any information about me, my login credentials, my email accounts, things like that, that appear in the dark web. Why? Because they can make a corollary of that to an actual data breach. And that's important. Why? If my password is compromised because I logged on Facebook, 
didn't even know it, but somehow a cyber criminal hacked into Facebook or a database and got a password or bought it on the dark web. Now my password's down there and they make that correlation. They report it to me. What do I do? I proactively go to my Facebook account immediately and change the password. And that's what's important. Having an intelligence to proactively go in and do take some action to protect your account. If I don't do that, my account could be taken over. So if you get a chance, check out the website, cyberlytica.com. They have different packages there from a single individual to a uh, small business's enterprise level. And you can actually get a package where they're constantly checking the dark web to see if your information's compromised and correlate that to a data breach so you can be proactive. It, it's affordable, it's simple to use, and it's something that you could make a difference and stop it before your information is fully compromised. And now you try to clean up the mess. I only speak from experience because years ago, my company was targeted, hacked, debit card, credit card. My Twitter account was hacked. I had $65,000 stolen out of our checking account, repeated DDoS to our online store. The list goes on and on and on. But I learned a fair amount of things. The sooner you can react to, 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 to limit the damage, the better off you are. Otherwise, it gets very expensive and very time consuming. So just some things to think about. And again, if I, if I went through this too fast, I apologize, but feel free to shoot me questions. I can give you a little bit more um, deeper dive or answer some of your questions if I, if I went over anything too fast. But um, I, I did mention, I touched on it earlier about another layer of security. And this is really important, two-factor authentication. <sighs> For cyber best practices, you need to always have layers of security. I like to relate it this way or relate it this way. Um, if you have a house, you probably have a door that you lock and you have a deadbolt. You, you have a, maybe a security camera, a ring doorbell. You have an alarm, perhaps, or stickers on your window. Those layers of security deter a physical thief to go to the next house or down the block or another neighborhood so they don't rob you. The same thing is true in the world of cybersecurity. It's important to realize having additional layers of security will deter cyber criminals and they simply move on to the next person. Again, doesn't mean they wouldn't don't have the ability to hack into our account or our computer networks. If they want to get in, they're going to get in. But if you make it hard for them or deter them, they're more likely to move on because they're lazy and time is money. They're running a business. So it's good to put in layers of security. One of the most important two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. Now, it could seem like a lot of buzzwords and tech technical, but it's really not. A number of years ago, everybody shied away from it because they were so scared. Um, but now you're starting to, to see it more prevalent. Everything from logging on to your simple social media, your Twitter, your Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, it provides a layer of security, multi-factor authentication. And you have to trade that because it's not as convenient. And I always say you got to make that balance. Do you choose security? over convenience. If you use multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication, in a sense, you're choosing security over convenience because it's going to take you a little bit more time because you're waiting for that password or have to take an extra step or whatever the case may be. Um, now, now, typically, this added layer of security helps in the authentication process. And what is it specifically? Well, it's something you know. I have it, have it listed on there if you could see the slide there. And that, that could be anything. Again, as mentioned, it could be a PIN, uh, the answers to a security question. Uh, it could be another password, whatever the case may be. So it could be that. It could be something you have. And, and that generally refers to something, a physical object or, or something like that. Maybe it's a security token or an ID card that could be used as well. Or it could be like your phone, sending a pin to your phone, or it's something you are. And what do I mean by that? Uh, facial recognition, biometrics, your finger, the Touch ID Apple has, things like that. So those, again, are layers that can be used there, part of the makeup of that two-factor or multi-factor authentication to validate it's you that are logging in, Scott Schober, password one, two, three, and now this second layer of authentication. Very, very important. That probably, that step alone will get rid of nine out of 10 times if somebody's trying to hack you, your information, your website, whatever the case may be, just by that step alone. Yet most people say, well, it's not 100% secure. This and that. It's not. There's ways around it. There's ways to intercept the text if a pin comes and this and that. To me, don't focus on all of that. Focus on how much more secure it is than just doing a traditional login with username and password. That's what's important, I think. Okay. Um, another layer that's really important is to think about is Wi-Fi. 
And again, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit quicker, but in a general sense, it's important that you secure Wi-Fi. That's the bottom line. And what does that mean? It means something with proper encryption, WPA2 encryption, whether it's your home office or whether it's your work, um, it should have proper encryption set. That's the danger of using free Wi-Fi hotspots. Oftentimes, they don't have encryption. When you have encryption, again, you're trading off security for convenience or, in, in many cases, speed. It may run a little slower with layers of security on it and encryption, but it's going to be a lot more secure. Now, if you go to your Starbucks or, or your local coffee shop or your local hotel traveling or airports are very common, oftentimes, cyber criminals go there, too. And they'll create what's called, a, in essence, a man-in-the-middle attack. They'll set up a rogue access point. So you have an access point or a wireless router at home. Imagine a cyber criminal goes into the airport, plugs into the electric, and has a access point, And they scan and look at whatever the ID is. And they see Boingo, you know, JFK Airport. They just simply create something that says transmits Boingo JFK Airport. So everybody within that proximity with their Wi-Fi goes, oh, look. Free Wi-Fi hotspot. Click, it lets them in. Now, instead of the, the actual Wi-Fi hotspot that's there, theirs is overpowering and closer, everybody associates to that access point. As you associate to that access point and go through your transmission, if you log on to the bank, stock market, send an email, doesn't matter what it is, that man in the middle attack basically is pulling off all that information. They store all that information. Later, they parse it and pull out login credentials, passwords, social security numbers, credit cards, anything that you send, because it's not going to be secure and encrypted as you think it is, because they performed a man in the middle attack. Bottom line, don't use free Wi-Fi hotspots. If you're traveling for business, mention that to your clients, even though they seem very attractive, because you're saving money, you just want to quickly download information. Instead, what can you do? I always recommend this. If you have a, an iPhone or Android, whatever, Create your own Wi-Fi hotspot. Why? You control the security. So you have a long, strong password to access your Wi-Fi hotspot. If I have my notebook computer, I turn my phone on, turn the hotspot on, close proximity, and what's happening? 4G, 5G to my phone it's talking, which is a modulated signal, hard to hack. And now I control the link between Wi-Fi with encryption and a strong password to my laptop. Yeah, you're going to pay money. You may pay data rates, this and that, but it's a lot better than giving into a free Wi-Fi hotspot where you give away all your information. So again, just best practices, things to think about. I'm trying to take you through the scenario so you can kind of understand the risks involved and share that with, with those in your organization and certainly with your customers. It's very important. Um, okay. So again, We talked a little bit about security and layers. I'm going to throw one more out there because oftentimes this is the, the no-brainer, but everybody overlooks it. And it's important for you in your organization and your, your customers, something as simple as shredding documents. I can't overemphasize this enough, and, I, and I'll relate it with a personal experience here afterwards. But if you if you get a traditional shredder that you get at whatever target or any basic store staples or something and it's about 20 bucks it's not very useful why because when you shred it the paper goes through and it's long shreds of paper there's a lot of automated software and optical tools now available on your phone and a laptop where a cyber criminal can simply dump out your garbage or your waste bin from your recycling lay all the strips out even if they're out of order doesn't matter and the software automatically will re-piece it together and recreate your document. If you saw it done before your eyes, you'd be scared to death. And it works and it's extremely effective. So basically, simple shredding, ripping paper in half is not good enough. And using a traditional cheapy shredder for 20, 30 bucks doesn't work either. You need what's called a micro cross cut shredder. It obliterates the paper into about 2000 pieces of confetti, tiny little pieces. That's a big difference. It's extremely hard to put that back together. Has, has um, NSA done it with some of their automated tools? Absolutely. But the average cyber criminal doesn't have the time or the money or the tools to put 2,000 pieces together amongst all the other shredded document inside of a bag or a bin. So just keep that in mind. 
I, I've got a couple different shredders I bought here, micro cross cut shredders that do 2000 plus pieces of confetti. It's about 200 and something dollars. So 10 times more money, but probably a hundred times more secure. So make sure that you consider doing that. That's important. Um, and, and sharing another point that's really important. I like to share this moving information from your computer in the office to your laptop at home or anywhere else. Oftentimes we'll say, oh, I'll do it securely. I'll do it on a USB stick because it's in my possession instead of emailing. In truth, that, that makes sense because email is very easy to read, especially if it's a Yahoo or a Gmail or Hotmail that's free. Why is the email free? Because the provider is giving you that in trade for collecting your data and selling it to advertisers and others. So that means they have to read your email content, not by a person, but automated. So basically anything in your email is not private anymore. So instead, put it on a USB stick. Now they sell USB sticks that actually have a code that you can enter, and that's what I use. I just enter in a six digit code to unlock the stick, stick it into my laptop, my, my desktop computer, whatever the case may be, if I'm traveling, and I store sensitive data on that stick. It's encrypted, AES 256 bit encryption. It's got a code. If you don't know the code after so many times, it locks you out or it'll just blow up in smoke, just like Mission Impossible. Those type of sticks typically are 50 to $60 up to maybe $400, depending upon how much storage you want on the stick. Excellent way to back up your computer as well. I'll talk about that at the very end. But you can get a four terabyte USB stick, stick it in your computer and copy all the contents of your sensitive data over and use that as your backup max method. Disconnect it from your computer, put it in the safe and you're set. It's not super quick, but it doesn't matter. You don't need it done immediately. You can take your time, move the files over and do that routinely at least once a month. Then you have a good backup. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so again, that, that's a, another layer of security that's often not thought about. USB and, and data in motion. And, and oftentimes USB sticks are lost. I, I've seen them on the ground all the time. Sometimes it's a it's it's debate you. They'll throw a USB stick on the ground at a trade show, hoping you pick it up and it says, oh, employee salaries. Let me check this out. You stick it in your computer, that downloads malware. So again, be in control of it. Make sure it's encrypted and there's a code so you can keep that data safe. Don't just take any old USB stick and shove it in your computer. Very dangerous. And again, that's an important to think about that from a layer of security. Um, VPNs, often, and I didn't get into this in detail and don't want to dive in too technical either, but at a higher level, it's important to use a good VPN, virtual private network. Why? Again, it keeps your data secure and encrypted. Um, it it, it is, is essential to, to use some type of VPN these days, especially when you're visiting sites that may be unfamiliar. Many sites will log and take information that you enter in your search key that you put in the top browser and again, sell that information. So in a sense, we're being followed. A VPN makes it more difficult to do this. Typically, if you're gonna go, when I go on the dark web, I use a good VPN, again, virtual private network in conjunction with using the Tor browser. That way my traffic is encrypted it's bounced around so they don't know the IP address of where I originate, and it keeps me safe. Important thing to remember, you might quickly say, oh, I'm familiar with VPNs if I like sporting events and want to watch a football game and it's out of the region or whatever, this and that. You got to be careful. If, if it's a free VPN, pretty much they're collecting your data, which kind of is converse of what you're supposed to do because you think of the VPN, it protects you so your data is not logged and not sold. But free VPNs, that's typically how they make their money. And hence, that's why it's free. Find a good VPN that you pay money and it may be three to five dollars a month or 50 bucks a year. And then put that onto your laptop, for example. And you could use that so you have a level of security. And that's really important there because the free ones, they're going to sell your information every time, at least as I dig in and do research on them. That's what I found out. So I don't recommend using a free VPN ever. It's not that confusing. It's not that hard. It probably takes you 10 minutes to download and start getting used to it in the background. It does tend to slow down your computer a little bit. So again, trading that convenience for security, security for convenience, keep that in mind when you're using these additional layers of security, but it will keep you much more safe. And that's what the bottom line is. So again, we're trying to achieve layers of security and do simple things that don't cost that much money often. That's more likely that people will adopt 
that and start using it and feel safer and actually be safer. And that's why it's so important. Um, let's see here. Next one I wanted to touch on briefly, because this is really the, the essence of most attacks. They start out with something seemingly innocent, which is a phishing email. We've all heard about it. You probably roll your eyes. It's not the Nigerian prince one that's so easy to spot and see, but rather it's a well-crafted email that has the right fonts, no spelling errors, good-looking graphics. That's extremely convincing. That will make you want to click on it. I, I get probably anywhere from 20 to 100 phishing emails a day because I'm often targeted. And it takes a lot of time making sure that the filter at my server is working well to get those out, my filters on my computer, my malware software and virus software to check all of that stuff, but still a percentage of it gets through. And that's what we don't realize. And sometimes it's a huge percentage, depending upon if you're in the world of Apple or PC, it varies. But on average, most of the, the malware software and virus checkers, the McAfee's and all these other things that people use, it stops about 20% of all the viruses from uh, coming through. What does it tell you? That means 80% do get through. And, and hopefully most of those go into your junk filter and hopefully most of them you spot and don't click on them before you're fooled. So take some time out and think about it because phishing attacks are typically linked to social engineering attacks. They're trying to garnish just one or two pieces of information from you. You receive an email and it may say, hey, this is from the, the fraud department of Bank of America. And they mentioned Dear Scott Schober. Maybe they show part of your account number or something else. Again, builds credibility. It may even list a phone number there. And if you actually picked your phone up and called it, that number may be a spoofed number. It may go to a redirect to somebody and say, hello, Bank of America Fraud Department, can I help you? So oftentimes they're going to do that because people now are skeptical and check, call the phone number, or they go to the bank site and say, yeah, this looks just like the website. And that's the same phone number listed. Hold on. But what typically happens in that phishing email, the link you click on does not go to your actual bank site. Obviously, it goes to a redirect, one that says Bank of America. Maybe one letter is spelled differently. Instead of the I, they used an L. Quick glance up in the browser, you're not even going to see that. So everything looks so convincing. Once you are redirected to that website, they're going to maybe even post some information that, again, looks convincing. You might put information in, Scott Schober, What's your security challenge questions? Da, da, da. You fill all that in. Guess what? They're stealing all that information as you're typing that in. So very careful. You got to, instead of that, clicking on the actual link, you're better off to go to your browser and type in bankofamerica.com, period. Not as convenient, but far more secure. Make sure it says HTTPS at the top for security. Maybe it shows a little picture of a lock too. A good sign to look for for a secure website where they have encryption and, and, and it's being carefully monitored, very important. There's lots of variations of phishing attacks. Um, there's vishing, which is voice phishing, smishing SMS text phishing, where they want you to click on a link. Did you ever get that? It comes over your phone. What is this? That's strange. at and I'm, I'm going to get an award. I just have my bill paid automated. If I click here, I get a reward. You're tempted to click on that. Again, it's either a redirect or it's a download with malicious software that gets onto your device. Don't do it delete, done. That's the best thing to do. So it's very important that we don't fall for these type of phishing schemes and other things like that. And I wanted to touch on one other area kind of at the end here, which was um, backups I mentioned. So just to jump to that real quick. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Now, when you do a data backup, I mentioned you should do it at least once a month. We have a, a structured plan within our company. We go around and each month our computers, we have independent computers and ones on the network, everything is backed up. And the way I do it, I, I do it on USB sticks, big, large USB sticks that are again encoded and encrypted. We back up the entire contents of a hard drive or the critical information, depending upon um, whose computer, if it's connected to the network or not. And then it's, it's what's called immutable. It's copied, but it can't be written over or erased. And that is removed from the building and put into a fire safe at a different location. In the event, the building burns down, floods, or something gets destroyed. And that way we have a complete backup of everything. And we have a, a very diverse company here from software programmers, hardware engineers, sales, everything all under one roof. So different backup 
um, systems we kind of use for different things. But the key is to have everything, all that intellectual property, customers' personal information backed up properly. So if it, we ever have a problem, suffer from a ransomware attack or fire, theft, anything, I can go and restore systems and stay in business. Very important. And, that, and that's important too. I always share that with people when you're talking about insurance and cybersecurity insurance, as you go through some of the checkoffs and the best practices, you're probably educating your, your partners, your customers, that they should be doing proper backups that are immutable, removed, not plugged into the internet. If you have a good cloud backup that is secure and encrypted, is that good? Yes, that certainly is good too. I always want to just point that out. So there's different things for different companies and different budgets. The key is that you're backing up your data. If you're not backing up at all, or you say, geez, uh, it's been a while, maybe it's a year or two, you're in trouble. Back up your data. If you get nothing else out from this presentation, the importance of backing up your data, it saved us numerous times as a company. And our, our, our expertise, again, is wireless cybersecurity. And we've been targeted and we've had problems. And many customers I talk to have also had problems. And fundamentally, when you can resort to your backup, it saves you every time. You go, Whew, I'm so glad I spent all that time and money. Most of the time you don't use it, but that's okay. Make sure that you do that, okay? Very, very important. Um, there's a whole lot more I'd love to talk about, but I really want to hear from you guys. If you have any questions, and again, I want to thank Beyond Insurance for putting this together. we got about 15 minutes or so. So if there's anybody that threw a question in the chat or do so now, then certainly she, she could throw them out my way and I'll try my best to answer them. And again, thank you guys so much for the, the, uh, the attention and listening into this presentation. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. This is great. We do have a couple questions, but if anyone else Sorry, has back. them, we can use the Q&A or the chat feature uh, to get those to me. But we do have a couple, so I will just kick those off. Um, one question was, are password managers such as Dashline and OnePass good to use? Yeah. Dashlane, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and in fact, I do use them myself as well. I use Dashlane, love it. Um, lots of different ways. I'll, I'll share with you my brief um, method for managing passwords. It's a little bit archaic and a little bit modern and something in between. I, I analyze my passwords, well over 200 of them. Some are super secret and secure, and I do it old school. And you're going to laugh at this, but I take a black book and I write them down. The date that I created it, my login credentials, the security challenge questions, which are, again, I always recommend don't answer them honestly. What high school did you attend? Well, I attended Edison High School. I'm not going to write Edison High School. I'm going to use it as an opportunity for multi-factor authentication and create a unique password there. So that's important to remember. So the, 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 the passwords that you keep near and dear to you that you don't ever want compromised, the most inconvenient way is to, to lock them up in a black book. And again, layers of security, black book, lock safe, locked office, lock building, cameras, alarms. It works. It's a pain, but it works. Next is using something like, like a dash lane, um, last pass others. Dash lane hasn't been compromised at all to my knowledge. Some of the others have had levels of compromises within uh, the password manager world. Uh, the, the beauty of a password manager is it disciplines all of us. We tend to be lazy when creating passwords. Long and strong, we tell everyone, make it 12, make it 15 characters, make it 20 characters. Guess what? We can't remember it. And we write it down in stupid sticky notes and everything else. Big mistake. Don't do it. Use a password manager. You got to remember one master password. That's it. One. And you could use a passphrase. You can alternate uppercase, lowercase, throw a couple stars on there, special symbols, a couple numbers. Anything that has absolutely nothing to do with you, that's what I encourage people to do. And it sounds counterintuitive because it's hard to remember. But yeah, that's the point. If it has to do with you, you could socially engineer when I was born, uh, my social security number, my birth date, my mom's maiden name, my pet's name, all that information is easily accessible for any cyber criminal within a matter of two minutes. And they feed that into these automated models along with a dictionary attack, every word in the dictionary, if it's part of your password, as well as all of the databases, billions of passwords that have already been compromised. Why do I say that? Because compromised passwords, their hope is, in fact, 54% of all people reuse the same password across multiple logins. Aha, cyber criminals got smart. If I buy the list of all the compromised passwords, more than half the time, 
some yo-yo reuse that same password to log into Facebook as well as Bank of America. I've got a good opportunity to possibly get in. It's all automated. Most of the tools, automated software guess over a million passwords per second. So it doesn't take forever. It's not someone sitting there going, you know, Scott's cat's name or know, guessing a birth date and all combination. It's not done that way. It's automated. Hit the button. It goes through them, millions upon millions of them until it hits and then gets in. And of course, once they get in and get one of your passwords, high probability, again, 54% people reuse the same password across multiple logins. It now goes not just to your Bank of America account, but every single major account on the internet to see which one they can automatically hack into. You see how dangerous it is not to use a good password manager. So excellent question there. I also recommend for, for sites that are more basic, if you're in the world of Apple, I use the keychain. So it links in the Apple ecosystem, my iPhone, my tablet, my laptop, my desktop, everything is tied into my keychains. Again, it's stored, it's encrypted, it's safe, but I don't use that for financial things because I want something even more. I want to hold it near and dear to me, but excellent question there. Thank you for bringing that up. And sorry, I didn't have that in the presentation just because yeah. of time. That's good. Uh, Kevin, I saw that you raised your hand, so you're able to unmute if you wanted to ask your question that way, or you can chat that in. It's, it's up to you. We'll let you figure that. We'll go to another question. Oh, there you are, Kevin. Maybe not. Put his hand down. <laughs> uh, another chat question was, uh, how many times a year should an organization change passwords? Everyone gripes about it, and we do it about twice a year. <sighs> That's a tough one. I'll, I'll tell you what people say, and a lot of cybersecurity experts and practitioners say, change your password every three months, six months, this and that. I don't agree with it. Statistically, if you do the research, if you create a long and strong password that has not been compromised, you should not change it. It only increases the opportunity for a cyber criminal to intercept that changed password. If it's not broken, don't fix it. I know it goes against what logic says and what everybody preaches and teaches, but it doesn't mean it's accurate. Statistically, if I, I have some passwords for some accounts, I created a long and strong password, never been compromised. I don't think it ever will. It'll take a million years for them to compromise it. This will all change when quantum computing comes out in a few years. All of the encryption standards that passwords are being used against, 128, 256-bit AES encryption and, and layers and hashing, all that other stuff, that kind of all goes out the window and we have to rethink the way things are done. It'll be more of a passwordless society to keep things secure and keep it properly encrypted, but that's still a number of years off. Okay. Uh, another question was, you had talked about the importance of backups. Um, a lot of people are on Office 365. They're backing up to their system. Are you recommending backups outside of that as well? I, I would, especially if you can identify, like, like, and you guys are in the insurance business. You understand this probably better than anyone else I talk to. When you go into a company, you identify what are your crown jewels? What are those assets most important? And you should share this within your organization and also to your customers. Once you can clearly identify them, then really what you want to do is you're trying to mitigate risk. You're trying to say, hey, for, for our company, we, we're in business 50 years. Uh, we have patents on things. We have a lot of intellectual property, a lot of firmware inside of microprocessors and things like that, microchip. We need to protect that. So those things, especially, we need to back up and have it immutable, not connected to the internet where it can easily be hacked, not up in the cloud, because if it is backed up, Microsoft 360, AWS, cloud, all these, they're encrypted, yes. Um, but what else is it? A lot of people don't realize this. There's always a redundancy. In other words, your data is being stored somewhere on a server. It's not really in the cloud. The cloud means a server remote. You don't know where that is. And there's always redundancy, which means there's another server housing your data. Has a server ever been compromised? All the time, things happen. So when you just poof, it goes up to the cloud, you do have to realize there are some risks. Is it being properly encrypted? Is it being stored properly? Is that being backed up? Where is the redundancy? Is it in China? I don't know. Only you can answer that by talking to who you're using. But I just like to point out, be cautious. I always feel much better. And again, I'm running a small business. We're 30 some engineers. It's easier to do this, to have intellectual property on a USB stick that's encrypted, locked and in my hand in a lock safe. If you're, you know, you or your client is running a 
300 people, 500 people, and are heavy into networking stuff, I would say a cloud option really does make more sense as long as you go with a good, reputable provider that can do the backups on the cloud. Do you have any mm -hmm. recommendations for those backup systems or putting them off site or some people could reference? Really difficult. A lot of people could argue on premise is better, off premise. Amazon keeps coming up more and more in my world is doing a great job because you don't hear them in the news a lot with associated to a data breach. And why? Because they do a lot of stuff to protect the data and keep it encrypted and watch over it very carefully. And in full disclosure, we do sell a lot of equipment to them for their servers to keep data secure. So I understand where some of the vulnerabilities are, where cyber criminals are trying to get in and steal data. So I think they do a great job. Microsoft 360 is going to be good. Well-known brands that if you have a problem, you pick the phone up, you know, the, the bat phone, you got to call and tell someone help. I need, somebody's going to answer. Somebody's going to help you through. That's important as well. A small rinky-dink company you never heard of, they may not be there tomorrow if they suffer a big breach and that's scary. Yeah. Uh, could you recommend a good book about cybersecurity for my parents? <laughs> That's one of the questions. Yeah, yeah I could. Again, 100% biased here. Um, cyber, uh, senior cyber, I wrote. I couldn't find a lot of books for seniors. And I was dealing with aged parents and an aged grandfather that was 99 years old. Passwords, he's constantly calling me, login problems, confusion on the computer, internet access, streaming things he had trouble with. So I said, let me go find a good video. Let me go find a good book. I couldn't find things. I got so frustrated. I said, that's it. That was my third book, Senior Cyber. I started interviewing seniors, interviewing relatives that were seniors and asked them, what's your frustrations? What are your problems? And how do I answer some of the most common questions in simple language, big giant fonts, keep it easy, keep it real. So there's actionable items. So people are not afraid to use the internet, not afraid to use computers, not afraid to use technology. So yeah, again, I'm biased, but, but senior cyber, um, certainly you could go on Amazon and pick up a copy of it. I forget what it sells for 10 bucks or something like that. It's yeah, right up here. I don't know if you could see that or not, but I think it's on the sc your screen as well. Perfect. Um, another question was about uh, people working from home. I mean, most of us, a lot of us are working from home now. Do you have any kind of safety tips around that people could give to their employees or practices yeah. they can put in place? Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, I talked a lot about this different webinars and presentations. Remote access, go back two plus years ago with the pandemic as everybody migrated to the work from home model. Great from some efficiencies, a horror when it came to cybersecurity. Why? Because again, if you go back to most major breaches, there was not two-factor authentication that I talked about. In other words, somebody's working from their home office, they're logging into their company's computer, and it's simply their basic login credentials. They're not using multi-factor authentication to authenticate it's them. That means that a hacker can easily get onto their computer. It could be through a key logger, malware that gets on your computer, every keystroke that you type to log into XYZ company, your company remotely, they just got that. Now they can get on there, change the password, take over your account, and you don't even notice it. Get into the computer networks, work laterally, steal all the data, get out and, and cover their tracks. So very dangerous. Must use two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication if you're doing remote access. Be careful if you're using a computer at home that your kids use to play games on. A lot of people don't think about that. Well, we share a computer, my wife, the husband, the kids play the games on it. Why? because who else has access to that computer? Are they keeping it secure? Is there a, a passcode to get onto the computer to unlock it, number one? There should be. Is your data encrypted if you're using Wi-Fi network? Maybe you signed up with your local cable provider at home and it's not that secure. You, you got the supplied you know, wireless router you pay 10 bucks a month for, and they say it has encryption, but WPA two or three encryption is not enabled. And in fact, most home Wi-Fi routers that are provided through a broadband provider offer free Wi-Fi hotspots to other people outside of your house or to the to the actual access point up on the telephone pole and, and connects into yours. So it's a conduit for people to, to hack in. So be careful there. You really got to set up a secure network and don't broadcast your SSID, your friendly ID that says 
you know, Scott's house with my address or anything like that. You can hide that. Um, make sure the encryption is set. Don't give that password out to anyone else. So if your your son has kids that come over and play games and they bring their, you know, their iPad or other, you know, their phone and, hey, can I use your Wi-Fi? Oh, yeah, here's the password. Guess what? The more people that have that password, it gets out. Next thing you know, you're in trouble. Instead, set up a secure network, set up a guest password. That way you can monitor it and make sure it's a long and strong password that allows people to go through only one channel to get on and it's encrypted. So th those are just some basic things with remote um, office. There, there's millions of things you want to be careful of, though, and a lot of it depends upon how you connect into that network system at, at your office. Perfect. I think another question about best books uh, to help parents protect their kids from the dark web access and others that would prey upon them. Oof. Um, yeah, there's a lot of books out there. I'm trying to think of one specifically. I actually started work. I'm not done yet. I'm working on another book, Teen Cyber, where I'm touching just on those exact subjects, social media, the dark web, um, keeping your kids off sites they shouldn't visit. There are some parental things, controls that you could put in play that if you investigate, such as YouTube, which is very popular, a lot of the social media apps, you could start doing that now. Um, I think that's important to at least investigate it and sit down and talk to your children. More important than anything, you could spy on your children. There's apps you can spy on their, their phone, their whereabouts, everything. More important that I've learned, sitting down talking your, to your children. So that way it's transparent. If they have a question, they stop and ask you. I had my son, he was playing a game and he was trading some points he got for some swag on one of the games. It's one of those car games or whatever. And the guy at the other end promised to give him something and he scammed him. My son was in tears. It was a couple of years ago. And I had to teach my son the importance of not trusting people on the internet. He said, but dad, he has a username and look at his ratings and look at this, look at that. But the, the most important thing I've learned, sit down and talk to your children instead of running out there and putting all these, you know, monitoring tools in place and blocking them. And now if, you're, if your child's disobedient and they don't listen and they go around you or they're more of a techie than you, then maybe you got to start upping your game a little bit and be a little wise. And then it makes sense to do some monitoring, things like that. But, but use caution. You want to build trust and confidence in your kids before you start using technology to monitor technology. It's not, it's not, it's a slippery slope. That's what I've learned. That's a good point. Those are all the questions that have come through so far. Um, I will definitely uh, put up the recording for this for our members and, and for your clients all as well. So I will thank you and everyone for your time today. This was super helpful. A lot of great questions that came through that got answered. So it was a wonderful use of time. So awesome. thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate you. And uh, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.